Uh, today I'm going to give you a highly idiosyncratic look at how to get a paper accepted. Um, and uh, you can divine what you, uh, what you uh, will about my opinion of this topic based on um, these uh, characters in the, in the back, uh, but we're not going to worry too much about it. So um, why, uh, why am I doing this? Uh, advice abounds on the internet about how to get a paper accepted, about uh, the scientific publishing process, the sanctity of the peer review system, and, uh, and what, what is an editor, what is an author's role, what is the reviewer's role. Uh, but what I find is that videos, uh, articles, and blog posts produced by, uh, by those that kind of run the system tend to be a little bit sanctimonious in their advice. Sanctimonious means they, they have a little bit too uh, high opinion of the sanctity of the peer review system, and, uh, and, and, and I, I don't suffer from those, uh, those delusions, and I don't think that you folks do uh, either, because we are all, uh, we are all human. And, uh, and We've all been in the position where we've spent six months or a year or two years or three years on a paper, and then somebody out there in the ether knows who we are, but we don't know who they are, and they spend an afternoon, if we're lucky, or an hour or five minutes, and all of a sudden, because they're the, the peer reviewer, what they say goes. And because the editor is trying to keep the impact factor high, um, one bad review can sink a whole paper. So what can we do to, uh, to, to minimize this occurrence while taking human nature uh, into account? Um, I think that in general, uh, the, the official sort of company line of the publishers is that the author is usually wrong because they need to have a high reject rate in order to keep the impact factor high, or they're simply bellyaching. That, that, uh, that the, the idea is that, well, the author is so personally invested, so of course they're going to complain when their paper gets a poor, uh, gets a poor review. There's an inherent asymmetry in the process that we uh, are, are certainly aware of. You've spent quite a long time on the paper, and the reviewer spent uh, ideally an afternoon or a day, but more realistically, they try to get the review done as fast as possible. Uh, it's very possible that the reviewer doesn't get it, so that's, uh, that's true, uh, but it may be because the author, so us here in the room, uh, didn't sell the, uh, the scientific results uh, appropriately. Now, sell uh, or marketing could be used uh, pejoratively, um, but really we're trying to convince a reader that what we're saying is worth, uh, is worth paying attention to. But sometimes the reviewer is just a curmudgeon. It's not a perfect system. It's like the criminal justice system, but we, we have it, so we have to make the best uh, of it. Um, just because I feel like justifying my, uh, my credentials in giving this talk, this is my publication history. You can find it here. 62 papers uh, written and around uh, 200 peer reviews, maybe over my whole career. Um, I've had 20 uh, rejections, uh, approximately, of these 62 papers. Um, most of these rejections have been since starting my independent career. So I did my PhD and my postdoc in rather famous labs, and maybe one or two papers total out of about uh, maybe 25 or so papers got rejected uh, as a PhD and a, and a postdoc. And that's, uh, uh, in large part, in my opinion, because there is the weight of a senior PI behind you on the author list. That is, I'm, I'm going to get flack for that for saying that, um, because certainly the company line of a publisher is to say, no, the review process is totally unbiased. But that is simply not, not, uh, not true. I think the quality of science that we're doing now is as good, if not better, than what I was doing um, as a grad student or postdoc. Um, so that's, that's, 
that's a, that's a little bit of a, of a soapbox for me, but it does happen to be true. Some people don't believe this is an effect, uh, but it, it really is. Let's say that out of 20 of these rejections, 15 of them were unique papers. So some papers are rejected multiple times because I, you know, as a young faculty member, I try to um, maybe push the envelope a little bit in terms of uh, where I think a paper could get into and maybe it, it's rejected from there and then rejected at the second choice journal and and so on, uh, so on down. So I would say that 15 out of these 62 were, were actually rejected at once. So I think this, this rate is, this rate is, is, is pretty good, uh, is pretty good. Um, I've also been a reviewer many times, and some of you may wonder uh, where these reviewers come from while well, they are also the people um, in this room. So uh, just to give you an idea, in 2016, I did 39 peer reviews. Um, uh, but I had 11 papers accepted, which is a 3.5 to 1 ratio of reviews done per papers accepted. I'm not quite happy with that. I need to increase the number of, paper, of reviews done or decrease the number of papers published, but that ain't going to happen, so, um, uh, barring a disaster. So, uh, so this was a 3.5 to 1 ratio. My career ratio, because at the beginning of my my, my uh, independent career, I was doing a lot more reviews per paper published. Um, and the ideal ratio is apparently 5.1 to 1 for the American Chemical Society, which is one of the largest uh, uh, society publishers in, uh, in academics. Now, how, where did I get this number? Because every, uh, every year, uh, this, this bullet point says, um, I accept the invitations that, I'm, that I believe I'm qualified to do. So if I'm interested in the topic and I'm qualified to do it, I accept the invitation. Um, and you know, sometimes uh, it, it might take accepting more invitations that I'm comfortable with to get this, this, uh, this number, this ratio higher, but I think that's just a matter of getting one's name out to more and more editors to be invited by them uh, to, uh, to review work. Okay, now how did I get this number 5.1 to 1 for the ACS? Because every year they send you a digital certificate that says the number of articles you published and the number of reviews you completed. Now this ratio is only 2 to 1 for ACS, but there are a lot more publication uh, um, publishers than just ACS. So, so this ratio, if we're only considering ACS, I wouldn't consider that I did a great service to ACS in 2016, um, but, uh, but I'm working on it. The number that you should look at here is that 43,000 total articles were published across all ACS journals and 221,000 reviews were published. And the ratio is 5.1 to 1. So there are 5.1 5 reviews for, per um, for every one paper published. And that takes into account the fact that uh, some papers are rejected, of course. Um, but, this, but given the fact that when you get reviews back, you usually get two or three, sometimes four reviews, the odds once you reach the review stage of getting your paper in are pretty good. So once you reach the review stage, it's not so bad. It's the Royal Society of Chemistry, which also publishes a lot of papers in uh, material science, uh, so my, my field, um, uh, gives you a, a similar email. And sometimes if you have multiple email addresses that, that the editors find, they'll send you more than one of these reports because they haven't consolidated the system or maybe I haven't consolidated my profiles. So you would see 13 reviews, 10 here, 3 here for RSC, the 13 in that review period. That doesn't count. Um, that doesn't count uh, Wiley and Elsevier and, and so on. Um, interestingly, uh, publishers have a system where they, some publishers have a system where they rank the reviewers. If you turn your reviews back in on time and they, they like you, they give you a high score, and then they ask you more and more and more and more and they keep asking you to do this. I didn't realize this, so I was flattered when Energy and Environmental Science, which is one of the top journals in material science for energy and other aspects of energy, um, asked me to do like a, a paper a week in 2013. Um, and as a result, in 2013, I did 20 reviews in only one email address, uh, so it was probably like 23 or 25 
for every, every other week I was reviewing a paper for energy and environmental science because I felt flattered. But what does that tell you about the quality of reviews that one is producing if that's the basis on which they are asking people to review papers? They ask the people to review papers who review papers frequently and who accept more uh, invitations. Presumably, the, uh, the ratio of reviews received to uh, papers published is higher for elite journals, but perhaps not. Because editors triage, that is, discard. <laughs> they discard papers that they don't believe will pass the uh, peer review process. And we'll talk more about that. I've also been an editor. I've never been an editor of a, uh, of a journal, of a series of journals, but I've been an editor of special issues of journals for MRS Advances, which is the um, kind of like the MRS Proceedings, what they now call the MRS Proceedings, and the a full issue of the MRS Bulletin. Um, but the, the, so I know how, uh, I, I sort of have a frame of reference for how to do the peer review system as the editor, um, but it's, it was never as a, as a full-time thing. Okay, now before we talk about submitting the paper and getting it accepted, we have to make sure that the paper itself is worthy of being <laughs> submitted. So in the fall, I, give a talk, I gave a talk on uh, scientific writing that some of you may have seen. Um, I'm actually gonna, uh, gonna record it uh, next week and put that on YouTube so it has all my, um, uh, my uh, wisdom, if you want to call it that, on how to, how to write a scientific paper. But let's just go through quickly what, it, what, it, what the paper itself has to be before we go through the mechanics of the actual submission and rebuttal uh, process. So we're assuming first that the work is, is worth submitting. Now, of course, you have to have good science, and good science is a necessary but not sufficient criterion for acceptance. It also has to be presented in a way that's comprehensible. So the purpose of the paper is to instruct the reader and ultimately change their behavior. That seems a little arrogant, but it happens to be true. Why else are we doing anything and communicating the result? We might want to change their behavior to, uh, to include using your technique, uh, interpreting their results in light of your results, um, to do something different. It is a mistake to assume that a paper is archival and uh, just to get it out the door, just so you can have another notch in your belt or notch in your shillelagh. This is Walter McGinn from Gangs of New York. I won't tell you why he has notches on his shillelagh, but he does. And just because this is kind of violent and, uh, and, and a dark movie, the Boston Celtics guy also has a shillelagh. So anyway, there's that. Anthony Bourdain said to make your food taste like restaurant food, you need a couple of ingredients to get something from nothing to something that's, 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 almost, uh, that's almost good. Uh, and his three ingredients for success that make your food different from restaurant sh food are shallots, garlic, and butter. So what are the shallots, garlic, and butter of, uh, of a good scientific paper? All co-authors must read the final version and agree with the conclusions. Sort of goes without saying, but it's sometimes not done. To a zero authority approximation, you'll be judged on the quality of your figures. So are they readable? Are they uh, quick to, uh, to interpret? The reader is not going to study the figures. They have to be fairly obvious what the meaning is. It has to be fairly obvious what the meaning is at only a, uh, with only a small time investment. And I know that there's some, uh, some compunction in us to, to make figures that are difficult to interpret because frankly they are difficult to interpret, uh, but we're competing with the attention of our potential readers. So they're not going to read your paper for fun. Some people will, but generally they're not gonna read it for fun. So they need, to be, they need to be hooked by something that's easily, uh, that's easily digested. Use fonts that seem absurdly large until shrunken to one column in size. Look at, the other, look at papers that were published by your research group 
and look at the plots, micrographs, and schematic drawings and copy the style. Don't copy the research, but copy the style. Eliminate jargon or define it early and without other jargon. The audience. What's the audience of a scientific paper? Uh, we may think that it's the five people that we care that care about our topic, but it's really not. It's the people that are potentially interested in our topic, as well as the people who are interested in our topic. The people who are potentially interested in our topic are first-year graduate students. So the level of jargon and uh, the presentation should be appropriate for uh, for a first-year grad student in your field. Read the prose out loud before submitting it. This takes a long time uh, and it's like frustrating because, oh, I already did this, but you'd be surprised at how many awkward sentences and, uh, and undefined jargon uh, you can pick up just by going to the somewhere where you're not going to bother anybody and just reading it out loud um, on the screen. Copy editing is, uh, say, the, I don't know, what are we up to, garlic or butter? But anyway, copy editing, editing is an important aspect. The copy editor will do all the copy editing, but the reviewer will pay attention to whether or not the copy editing is done, uh, is done correctly. Uh, variables are italicized. Superscripted references go outside the punctuation uh, when, and placed at the end of a sentence unless the particular uh, journal that you're submitting to has, has the opposite conven convention, where the number goes in the interior. In the US, commas and periods go inside quotation marks, period, end quote. In the UK, they go outside. But again, check with the journal. Uh, by the way, the US uh, met mode here is clearly the wrong, <laughs> the wrong way to do it. Uh, but there it is. Uh, one space after a period, not two spaces after a period. There was a terrific, delicious takedown six years ago in Slate on uh, why two, peri two, two spaces after a period is a bad idea. Double space the drafts, but put the final few drafts into the template. If there's no template, put figures near where they are mentioned in the text. What do I mean by template? Some journals offer a template. So something that looks kind of like the final version of the paper. It has two columns, single spaced, um, and it allows you to arrange your figures in, in a nice uh, way. It also shows the reviewers that you've taken care to follow the formatting for that journal exactly. And I think, I don't have scientific evidence for this, but I think it tells the reviewer that, well, it's already in the template. I might as well accept it. <laughs> I have never had a paper that was written in, in the template be rejected. This is what the final version of this uh, article looks like. You know, pretty similar. So get the, get the imagination of the reviewer on your side. You can also abuse templates. This is the total synthesis of chocolate milk via novel, novel spoonless protocol. And I wrote this in 2004 in the journal Applied Chocolate Milk Letters using the organic letters template. And Hershey syrup goes into the Boston Bruins cup, swirl around the milk. See, very clear figures here. And then this fellow whose name is Doofberg. Uh, drinks it and he says yum and that's the product of the reaction. Nice references here to syrup pouring monthly and there it is. So you can have some you can have some fun. You can make your own fun. Who are the players in the manuscript submission process? Well uh, any submission has the interplay of an editor, an author, and uh, multiple reviewers. So uh, we are the author. Let's pretend we are the author. There's an editor out there. And the reviewers, usually there are two to four of them. Sometimes there's an appeal reviewer. The editor is usually a mid-career or senior scientist, generally not a junior uh, career scientist. But sometimes um, some publishers use a professional editing staff. So like the Nature Publishing Group, 
which is a, a, uh, a part of uh, Macmillan Publishing, uses a professional staff. They're PhD scientists, but they specialize. They don't do any research. They specialize in, um, in rejecting your paper. Oh, wait, in, in reviewing uh, your papers. Wiley VCH uh, is another professional um, editing house. I think they are publishing house. They use uh, kind of a, the, usually, uh, at least with the advanced materials journals, they are um, they're professional editors. I'm not exactly sure about the other ones. Some society uh, edi uh, editorial um, staffs like uh, RSC, which publishes energy and environmental science, uses a professional staff, but not all RSC journals do. Journal of Materials Chemistry, for example, uses um, uh, senior scientists from the community as their uh, associate editors. Editors are often your colleagues, so the, they're the people that read your papers and go to your talks. They also submit papers them, themselves because the roles revolve. So everyone involved in this process except for grad students, postdocs, and assistant professors have played all of these roles throughout their, uh, throughout their careers where to submit. So you have a range of choices on where to submit. You have uh, something like Science, which is a broad uh, a, a journal with, with a broad readership, broad topics, uh, high impact factor. I'm going to stick to the materials field because it's the field that I know the best. You have advanced materials, which is, of course, only materials uh, science, particularly with an emphasis on chemistry of materials. And then there are specialist journals which, like Macromolecules, which is one of the top uh, polymer uh, journals for polymeric uh, material science. And, uh, and you, have to, you have to decide on what size of an audience and what the perceived impact of this paper is going to be as you, uh, as you submit. Should you go for science every time? No, and why not? Because Statistically, it's going to be rejected, uh, and that costs time, and time is money. And if you aim for some place where you don't think the, the, the expected audience is going to be large enough, or uh, maybe it's a scholarly but perhaps incremental uh, bit of knowledge that you created, it might appeal to a smaller and smaller uh, segment of the scientific uh, reader community. So if you shoot too high, you also irritate the editors. And that's uh, not, it's not a joke because they, they're human beings and if you keep submitting stuff that's not going to be appealing to a broad audience, they're going to keep rejecting it and they're going to be uh, upset with you and not give you the benefit of the doubt in the future. It is okay to push the envelope a little bit. Uh, but don't go overboard. Not every paper belongs in science and aiming too high annoys the editors and wastes your time. So uh, once we have settled on, once we have a good paper that is full of garlic, shallots, and butter, uh, we, have, have, we have the good paper, the science is good, we know what journal, then we have to write a cover letter. Now, uh, sometimes the, your PI will do this for you. Um, I like to have people in the group take the first uh, shot at this. Um, sometimes sometimes be, be aware of whether or not this, the, the letter is going only to the editor or also to the referees. Sometimes it goes to the referees too, and in which case they'll, they'll usually call it in the submission uh, window the letter to referees. In either case, though, you want to address them as human beings not as a recapitulation of the abstract. And why not? Because they have the abstract already. You really annoy editors by just cut and pasting the abstract or even large sections of the abstract. What you need to do is tell the editor and the referees, if it's going to the referees too, what did you really do? No jargon. What did you really do and why did you really do it? Specifically, like, be human about it, not uh, a jargon-laden sentence that tells you know only the five people that you know really care about this this specific topic. What did you really do? Why did you really do it? 
So here's an example of a, uh, of a cover letter that I submitted, uh, my group submitted last year. And the first paragraph is always the same. It says, what, what is the title and then the authors? And then you usually have to have some statement about the fact that the manuscript has not been submitted elsewhere and is not under consideration at any other journal. You're also going to verify that by checking a box before you submit that it has indeed not been submitted uh, elsewhere. And then this, instead of recapitulating the abstract, this paragraph uh, is, uh, is science with humanity. It's like an abstract, but with, with the human aspect. The technique described in this manuscript has a practical motivation. We found that any time we synthesized a new pi conjugated material or purchased an expensive one from a commercial supplier, we had to consume many hundreds of milligrams to find the optimal thicknesses, solvents, annealing temperatures, and other processing parameters. That's not like an abstract would read. That's literally what you did and why you did it. So tell them that. Um, we talk a little bit about results here, and then there was a particularly human aspect. So this, this, for a frame of reference, this was a technique that we were publishing to increase the speed at which photovoltaic materials could be evaluated by using a combinatorial approach with thicknesses and compositions and so forth. So one of the ideas was that you could take a very small amount of material and get lots of data from it. So, uh, so I put this in. Uh, the material. So we also optimized the thickness and annealing temperature for a new material synthesized in our laboratory. This material was synthesized by a postdoc who departed the lab in 2013, and we only had 100 milligrams left. The only way to make more would have been to ask another student or postdoc to synthesize it along with its starting materials at the cost of whatever other project he or she may have been working on. So this is, this is serious, right? This is really why we, why we did it. And the editor wants to know that, and the referees want to know that. Uh, sometimes you may not, well, if you, if you know the editor, it's a little easier to speak in a conversational style, but you're not always going to know the editor or what editor you're going to get. And it's always fine to keep a slightly more formal, formal but still uh, uh, human style. Thank you, uh, Daniel, for letting me use this, even though I didn't ask. But this is uh, Daniel's cover letter, and it's really, uh, really well, uh, uh, well written on um, this this uh, comparison of techniques to measure the mechanical properties of organic semiconductors. So we'll, we'll this will be on YouTube. We'll also have the slides in case it doesn't come out even in 4K resolution. Okay, uh, roles of reviewers and editors. Usually a journal will allow you to suggest uh, reviewers. Not uh, always, but sometimes. Actually, almost always. Plus One doesn't allow you to do this, but most other journals do. So the editor doesn't have to take your suggestions on, uh, on who uh, should review your paper. When you suggest reviewers, uh, usually you're asked to suggest at least five, but some people in the community will say you can suggest a lot more than that to make the editor's life really easy. But you have to be able to find 10 people that know enough about your topic and that will also give you a fair review. Knowing uh, about your topic does not mean that they were former lab mates or people that worked for your PhD or postdoc advisor. Um, if the editor detects even a hint of nepotism in the, uh, in the suggested reviewer list, they get upset. So uh, fewer than half of the people. Um, some editors would suggest none of the people, but in practical terms, that's usually not possible and not necessarily desirable because sometimes people that are one or two generations removed from you through your advisor are the ones that really know the topic. So there has to be some crossing of family trees or whatever it is. So importantly, choose people that you believe will give you a constructive and, uh, and fair uh, review. Because they, may, they don't have to take your suggestions, and they can pick somebody who will not give you a constructive or fair review. When you suggest uh, editors to the uh, editorial staff, Find the associate editor that's closest to your topic. 
to closest to your topic, but suggestions are used only sometimes. In fact, um, sometimes there are clear-cut cases where there's obviously an editor that knows about your topic, but sometimes they'll just, they'll just pick somebody because maybe the person you suggested is busy or for whatever reason. So you've submitted your manuscript. After a few days, uh, you are either, your paper is either rejected without review or it's assigned to an editor. Sometimes you get a notice that it's assigned to an editor and then it's rejected without review, which is frustrating. Then we wait for four to eight weeks. <laughs> and then we play the waiting game. And because the audio file of Homer saying these words is playing on my computer, I have to wait till he's done. Um, email apnea. Email apnea is when you get an email and you stop breathing because you're afraid of what it might say. And usually they're written like this. Journal, decision on submission, and usually if you're like me and you don't take your own advice about not checking email 20 times a day, sometimes I'm good at that, often not. Uh, this is in bed when you get this email, especially from European uh, or Asian editors uh, because they're not in your time zone, so they did it while you were sleeping, and you get this email. Decision on submission to Journal Materials Chemistry A, better than coffee, right? And they don't tell you in this line whether what the decision is, so you have to open the email and continue to not breathe until, until it is. And then it doesn't matter, this is RSC, this is ACS, same thing, same, same thing. And then when you open up the email, it's going to say one of a few things. Accept as is, which almost never happens. Minor revisions, which you can think of as a provisional accept. Major revisions, in my uh, experience, they have almost always been accepted in the end uh, of doing a major revision if you do it. Uh, if you do it in a, in a, in a conscientious way. Uh, reject and resubmit, which I think is effectively the same thing as a major revision, plus some additional administrative hoops that you have to, that you have to jump through, like submitting the whole thing again. Uh, transfer, they might offer to, because they've already invested this time in doing the triaging, and they've gotten the reviews already, they might suggest to transfer to another journal within the same publisher. I don't like the journals to be able to get away with this, frankly, because it says that the second best journal for your paper also happens to be within their portfolio of journals. Uh, but they do, they will suggest this sometimes. Or reject outright. Importantly, we should know that most editors and reviewers, the vast majority of them, are not trying to destroy your career. Even though that's what it's going to feel like when you get this email and you open it and it says reject. They are not actually trying to destroy your career. It does not feel good now, but getting a real reaction is the only way we learn. Okay, th that's the only time I'm going to give you, some, give you a platitude in this talk. I think you, you will agree with me that I've been pretty cynical up to this point. <laughs> But this is really true. Getting a real reaction is the only way we learn. With, some, with some, something on the line, like our reputation, our scientific, our best work, we submit it and it gets rejected. It really, uh, you know, rather than just say, <clears throat> you just don't know anything about anything. And, uh, but, but really, what we did was um, we got a reaction and, and those, you can't, uh, you, you can't, you can't really pay money to get a reaction for something that's, that, that, that really uh, matters. Importantly, it helps you refine your arguments. So if you never get, like, I don't know, taken down in jujitsu, you'll never get better. Not that I would know. Because I'm just so good at jujitsu. <laughs> uh, some examples of referee uh, reports. Category one is critical, but fair and detailed. 
This is a particularly long referee report, but uh, you like getting ones like this, frankly, especially if they're going to reject it because it tells you all these things that you can do to improve, uh, to improve the paper. The recommendation was major revisions as noted. I'm going to show you reviewer 3's comments. Uh, and this is for the same paper. And the paper is, it's a pretty simple idea, but it was, it was kind of, it was, it was kind of useful. Instead of doing photolithography to generate micron scale features, you just do mechanical abrasion of a water soluble film. Then you do lift off of the abraded surface after you deposit metal. We found that you could get really nice sheet resistances for photovoltaic uh, cells by using this really dirt cheap, simple method of patterning the electrodes. Ultimately, this paper was accepted, but it was rejected this time because of reviewer three who said, to use a razor to introduce the pattern is simple but useless. It is difficult to control the size and the, and the uniformity. It does not contribute anything for this area. It should not be published. <laughs> That's it. I didn't crop this. So this is critical, but useless. And also, <laughs> I'm not going to say what journal this was, but this is bad editing to allow a useless comment like this pass for a referee report when this person spent three hours reading your paper and commenting on it. Once you get the referee reports, you have to write a response letter. Quote the referee reports verbatim, almost verbatim. Correct any typos, even though you will want to retain the typos to make the reviewer look stupid. <laughs> Correct them anyway, because in a published, in, in, a, in a document that you sign or your PI signs, it can't have typos in it. And, and the editor knows that if you left the typos in, it's because you want to make them look stupid. Don't be emotional, but you can be emotional on the first day and write the, ref write the re response letter that you feel, and then don't send that response letter. <laughs> Put every change in the response letter. Do not say, we responded to this in paragraph 3, line 2, see the manuscript. Because the that asks a lot of the reviewer. They have to open up the manuscript again, and they don't want to do that. They, only, they want everything to be self-contained within the response letter. They should read the manuscript again, but they are not going to. Sorry, they're just usually not going to. Reproduce the responses even if multiple reviewers made the same point. Two reviewers made the exact same point, but they may not even want to read the responses triggered by the other reviewers. They may only read their section of the response letter. So don't say, flip back 10 pages to this other place. Keep everything self-contained. If a figure required changing, put the figure in too. Put the revised figure in uh, as well. Take a few days uh, to sleep on it. If you're still angry when you send the response letter, you haven't waited long enough. Sometimes your anger may not subside, and maybe you have a legitimate reason for being angry. Or maybe you're not angry because you don't get angry, um, if, in case you're not human. <laughs> and you still want to appeal the process because you think your argument is really legitimate. Use the appeal process sparingly. Submitting a paper and getting your paper triaged partially annoys the editor, but appealing a decision of the editor 
really annoys them. So make sure that the reviewers were objectively wrong about what you said, or um, as objectively wrong as science permits. Also, sometimes this is called a rebuttal letter. That implies conflict. Don't use the word rebuttal letter. In this rebuttal letter, we rebutted these comments, and this is how well these comments were rebutted. And don't use the word rebuttal in the file name of the response letter in case the file name goes unchanged back to the reviewers. Rebuttals are fighting words. Sometimes shillelaghs are used. There are some examples of response letters. Here is an example of a response letter, uh, recent. Um, there's a beginning part of the response letter where you address the, uh, the editor, and if they say really nice things about your paper, if the re reviewer said some really nice things about your paper, then you can reproduce those in this section, um, just to kind of highlight uh, that, uh, that, uh, that you got some favorable comments, and then give a general statement as to what the main criticisms of the reviewers were, what you did to address those, and then go on your point-by-point -point response to them. So reproducing the, uh, the reviewer's comments. So break it down into the review usually has like a big paragraph at the beginning and then a couple of sub points below it. So you can break down the first paragraph into review one, summary comment, review one, summary comment one, summary comment two, summary comment three. You can break apart that first paragraph. And then you can take the regular comments, excuse me, like comment one, two, three, and then respond to them. Use um, uh, lots of different levels of indentation to show what the reviewer said, what your reply was, and what your change to the manuscript was as a re that was triggered by the, uh, by, the, uh, by the comment. So three levels here of indentation uh, used. In this particular example, I don't have figures that were changed, but there often are, and again, put those in the letter. Um, it's kind of trite to thank the reviewer for everything, but you should express some kind of appreciation. Now, if you were at my talk on how to win friends and influence people, this means be specific about what you appreciate. Thank you for pointing out the fact that blah, blah, blah. But you're writing to the editor, not to the reviewer. Everything is mediated by the editor. So you say, reviewer one makes a good point that blah, blah, blah. And that's, you know, be, be genuine about it. What are the final steps in the process? This is an important point. Um, I put this in here again. If it's rejected, use the appeal process sparingly and wait, sleep on it at least one day before deciding to appeal. If it's accepted, read the proofs carefully. So they'll send you what the paper is going to look like in its final form with the line numbers that you can refer to when you write up the corrections. If you make too many comments on the proof, it will delay publication. And the reason is because the copy editor will be worried that they made a mistake in transferring your comments back into the manuscript. Then they'll send it back to the editor, and they'll need you to reproof it. And you don't want to do that because time is money. This has cost us up to two weeks for some cases. So make sure that. Uh, that you make your corrections before getting to the proof stage. So the final version, make sure you read it really carefully, make every, every, uh, every word perfect so that you only make ideally no changes to the proof. Sometimes in the copy editing process, some things get introduced that you didn't want to be introduced or, you, or there's a wrong word in there or something. So make sure that the changes are actually uh, not, uh, not, not trivial and, and ones that, uh, that, that you couldn't have made uh, already. After it's posted online, it's time to celebrate and share on social media. And also, do yourself a favor and don't read your own papers right after they're published.
because you may find a word <laughs> that you didn't like or a comma that's out of place. And you know what? Nobody cares. It will upset you and you only, but not after a month. OK, uh, as if I haven't already been on my soapbox, I have a couple of pet topics. Um, well, topics that I just, I just want to comment on or define or, or get your reaction to. Um, one question is, who owns the results? So the vast majority of our work was not vast, but a lot of our work was, OK, at least half, was funded by uh, federal or state governments. And then a good other portion was funded by uh, by industry contracts and, uh, and so on. So who owns the results? And this is um, something that's kind of uh, been a uh, point of, of contention recently because some subset of journals are for-profit, some are uh, society-based journals, nonprofit journals like ACS and RSC, whereas Macmillan slash uh, Nature and Wiley VCH are for profit. Um, and there are some scientists who are getting really upset about the fact that the public paid for the research, the scientific community did the research, the scientific community did the vast majority of the editorial work in the form of referee reports, and the for profit journals make the money off of all of the free content and the free editorial services. I'm just going to throw that out there. There are publication fees. Particularly, there are co color graphics fees. And some publishers charge color graphics fees even for online content. Please join the fight and resist <laughs> paying to turn pixels from black and white to red because it takes no, in fact, to turn a pixel from black to red takes less energy because it takes energy to turn a pixel all the way off on an LCD screen takes the most energy. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Get out of these if possible. Open access journals, that means that you put a paper uh, online and anyone can, uh, can download it. Uh, but often the way that this model works now is that it costs money on the part of the submitter to get a paper open access. Some journals are fully open access, some only have open access options. There are society journals versus nonprofit uh, versus, uh, this should say for profit. Society journals are nonprofit, and then there are for profit journals as well. Uh, there is some, uh, some, auth some publishers, uh, like uh, some of the nature journals, in fact, offer blind reviewing where they can't see your name when you submit. Um, and this could be good or bad if the, if the reviewer is really in your field and they see that 20% of the citations came from one particular research group, they can guess fairly easy, easily who it was. So I'm not sure to what extent this is going to take off, but it's out there. Uh, we talked about manuscript transfer services. I put services in quotes because I, I, uh, I'm a little skeptical as to whether or not this is actually a service or just um, avarice on the part of the, uh, of the publisher, frankly. I'm tenured now, so I can say that. Uh, there are repository services for fields outside of um, chemical sciences, biological sciences, bioengineering. For mathematically and physics-focused fields, they have um, uh, Archive, which is an online service that preprints are uploaded to um, uh, before publication. This is a really nice model. Um, and certain, certain funding agencies and institutions are trying to, um, uh, trying to give us, give the rest of the scientific community an archive-like function. So not many people here probably know this, but in the UC system, and all research funded by the National Institutes of Health uh, must be publicly available. So the pre-copy edited version has to go in a repository. So that's true at UCSD. All of your research 
must be freely available in pre-copy edited form after some certain embargo period. Other resources, if you're interested in this topic, um, the ACS published a video series, Publishing 101. You can go to the American Chemical Society YouTube channel to find that, and they have different vignettes from different editors and famous authors, and that's really useful. I really like uh, George Whiteside's uh, interview on this. You can find his YouTube comments here, but, he, but you, they also have the, um, the full audio version that you can download, which has the entire Q&A session. It's 43 minutes, but it's well worth it that you can download separately. Um, uh, Andrea Armani, who's a chemical engineering professor at USC, has some great resources that she wrote on uh, this and other professional topics on her website. You can just Google her. Uh, there's a book uh, that's really good, A PhD is Not Enough, A Guide to Survival in Science by uh, Peter J. Fiebelman. It's, uh, it's, it's an appropriately and appropriately uh, cynical take on uh, PhDs and the decision to go to grad school. Uh, writing in general, I would look at, uh, if you have a few minutes, The Elements of Style by Strunk and White, but there's a lot of stuff in here that's inconsistent and wrong, so if you want the correction to Strunk and White, I really like the book The Sense of Style by Steven Pinker, um, and that's good for, uh, for all kinds of writing uh, topics. Uh, and I have another talk on writing that I'm going to post uh, next week. I'm giving it in part of a, a, a seminar um, uh, elsewhere uh, on campus. So you can find that if you have not already seen it or if you want to see it too. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. And we have like one or two minutes for questions, which I'm happy to take. Any questions, discussion, comments? Uh, Ryan first. What's the most frustrating rejection you ever had? I think I showed it. The most frustrating rejection I ever got was the was the one and one eighth line from that person <laughs> who I don't even know if they read the paper. Laura. Uh, you touched on appealing a decision uh, after the review process. Um, how did the editor feel about appealing the editor's decision of not sending it to review? Uh, I have, I have never repeat, I've never appealed a decision from an editor not to send it out for review. Um, so I, I can't, I don't have any experience to comment on that. I think I've appealed out of 62 papers, I've appealed three times one, one, and lost two. Thank you. Um, so in the event that they decide to transfer it to another journal within their, uh, their group, saying that you had a second uh, a plan B in another group, can you reject their transfer? So the question is, can you, if they, if they offer to, to send your paper to another, or to another, another journal in the same publisher, um, can you reject the transfer? You absolutely can reject the transfer. If they reject your paper, the transfer option is just an option that is not, that you can take if you want, but your paper is rejected. And one thing that people do is, okay, we're just not going to respond to the transfer request, and we're going to submit it somewhere else in the meantime. And if it gets rejected there, we'll take them up on their transfer <laughs> offer. You can absolutely do that because the paper is rejected. The paper is rejected. They do not. Own, they don't. They don't have any rights to anything if they do reject you it. Mention it in your letter to the editor? That's a good point. When papers are, some journals will ask you if the uh, if the paper has been rejected by another journal within our system, and you have to be honest about that. Some journals will ask you if it's been rejected by any other journal. And usually it is not required to answer that question, but they do have the box there available because they want more information if you're willing to provide it. And I don't think it's that bad a thing to, I mean, the transfer process is 
you know why they're doing it, right? Because they want to save the resources and they know how tempting it is. But that's also arrogant on their part because they're assuming that out of a hundred journals you could have submitted to, that the next best journal happens to be in their system. And if you would only submit it there, we could just process this really quickly. And, uh, and then by the way, we wouldn't have to do any, we wouldn't have to spend any more manuscript acquisition costs, any more time of our editors. We wouldn't have to go out for reviews again. It's a really good deal for them if you take them up on it. So don't, don't feel bad about shopping it, you know, about shopping it around. What you cannot do is just flat out submit the same work to two, two places simultaneously. There's no, no way. There, it can, a paper can only be under review at one journal at one time. Once it's rejected, you can send it somewhere else. Yep. The, the question is, if you submit it to another journal after it's been rejected from the first journal, they have access to the comments if the paper was submitted to this, if the two journals are in the same publisher. Yes. Otherwise, they might ask you in the submission form, and if you say, yes, it's been rejected, then they're going to ask you for the, for the referee reports from the previous submission. But um, uh, I'll take other questions, but um, after we uh, break, because we're out of time, but thank you very much again.